So here's an example piece of code. Okay, so this is a sequence of about eight instructions. And let's just first analyze what this code is doing. So the first instruction is adding two values, putting it into R1. The second instruction depends on the first because this value of R1 is being fed as an input to the second instruction. That second instruction produces a value in R4 and that's used again by the third instruction. So there's an another dependence over here. And you use that to compute an address, bring something into R5. That's used in the next add. So again, there's a dependence between these two. That puts a result into R7. Again, R7 is being fed to the next instruction. So yet another dependence. So you have this chain of dependent instructions. Then the very last three instructions turn out to be independent of the previous three instructions. So if you look at this instruction here, it needs the value of R4. The value of R4 was produced as early as the second instruction here. So there's a dependence between this instruction and this load here, but this load does not depend on the previous three instructions, right? So essentially, once you've figured out the value of R4, it's possible to execute this load down here as well. And then there is the same set of dependencies where R9 feeds into the next instruction and R10 feeds into this next instruction. Okay, so this is almost like you kind of scanning a string or, or going through an array, looking at the first element in the array represented by 8 plus R4. You're loading in that value and then doing some math. Then you're looking at the next element of the array. So you're fetching 16 plus R4 and then doing some math on it. So this is almost like you going through a bunch of elements in an array. And so this is a very common pattern that you might find in many programs. So how does this behave on my in-order processor? Okay, so in, on the in-order processor, we know that if the first instruction is fetched in cycle one, the first instruction finishes in cycle five, right? This is my simple five stage in order pipeline. So the first instruction finishes in cycle five. The second instruction depends on it, but we've seen that with bypassing, you don't need to introduce stall cycles for this dependent instruction, right? If the first instruction is an add, the second dependent instruction can come right behind it. So it finishes one cycle later. The load finishes one cycle later. Again, with bypassing, you don't need to introduce additional stall cycles. Then we've seen that when you do a load, even with bypassing, the dependent add has to be stalled by one cycle, which is why this add instruction finishes in cycle nine and not in cycle eight. And then continuing on, the next add finishes in the next cycle. Then the load finishes in the next cycle. Now there's a dependence between these two and there's a load, so you need one stall cycle. So it finishes in cycle 13. And then finally, the last instruction finishes in cycle 14. So executing this on the in-order processor, it takes about four cycles to warm up the pipeline. But once you've done that, in the next 10 cycles, I was able to finish these eight instructions, right? So if you ignore the warm-up time, the CPI is 10 cycles to finish eight instructions. And you essentially had two stall cycles, one because of this load feeding this add, and a second stall cycle because of this load feeding this add over here. Now let's look at how this would behave on my out of order processor. Again, let's assume that it's, it's some kind of five stage pipeline, but I'm smart enough to say that if two instructions don't depend on each other, they can both execute in the same cycle. Okay, so early on, because of all these dependencies, out of order execution doesn't really help you, right? So the first instruction finishes in cycle five and the four dependent instructions after that finish in subsequent cycles. And again, because a load instruction takes longer, you have this one cycle delay or one stall cycle between the load and the dependent add. But now if you look at this load over here, if your instruction fetch unit had been bringing in multiple instructions and if, and if you had placed multiple instructions into the issue queue, the issue queue can look far ahead and it realizes that you know this load, it only depends on R4, right? So this dependent of, of R4 issues you know one cycle after this add and so there should be nothing stopping this load also from issuing at the same time, right? So this, set, this load over here and this load over here have the same kind of dependencies. They both depend on the value of R4 and these two loads don't depend on each other, right? So these two loads can actually go through the pipeline together as long as you have enough resources to handle two instructions at the same time, right? And I already said that I'm going to allow you to process multiple instructions at the same time. That's referred to as super scalar execution, where you do multiple instructions at the same time. But because I'm doing that, both of these instructions go through the pipeline at the same time and both finish in cycle seven. Okay, and once they finish, they wake up their dependent instructions in the issue queue. So this add instruction says, hey, you know, I was waiting for R5 and R6. R5 was just made ready, so now I can execute. 
And similarly, this add instruction says, I'm waiting for R6 and R9. R9 just got produced, and so I can also execute. So both of these add instructions leave the issue queue at the same time, they execute together, they finish at the same time, and so both finish in cycle nine. And then again, the same thing happens with this add, right? So when this add and this add over here finish, they wake up their dependent instructions, they both leave the issue queue at the same time, they finish together, and so both finish in cycle 10. So because I can do multiple instructions in the same cycle, and because I'm able to figure out that these instructions here don't depend on the instructions before them, they can both execute together in parallel. So once you warmed up the pipeline, once you spent four cycles warming up the pipeline, in the next six cycles, you were able to finish these eight instructions. So the CPI is now six divided by eight, which is a huge improvement over our in-order pipeline. Okay, and so, you know, if you got rid of stall cycles, this basic design can, can achieve a best CPI of 1.0. In this case, you, you can get a CPI of less than one because you're doing multiple instructions in the same cycle. So for example, if you can complete two instructions in every single cycle, you should have an ideal CPI of 0.5, right? So this one is trying to approach that CPI of 0.5, but because it has a few stall cycles like over here, because there are some cycles where only one instruction finishes, it falls short of that ideal goal, right? So you have a CPI of 0.75 here, which is worse than say your theoretical best of 0.5. But you'll see that this design is still way better than the CPI that you achieved in your basic in-order design.